103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM, right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday morning, October 3rd, 2021. I'm Larry Rhodes, or Doubter 5, and as usual, we have our co-host Wombat on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. I took a week of vacation, and now it's just going to be raining all week. Yeah, oh, yeah probably. rain has come, <laughs> um, but you know, that's good. Uh, our guests today are George Brown, the second and a half from Brooklyn. How are you? I'm good. And Dread Pirate Higgs, all the way from Canada. Hello. Uh, Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about <laughs> atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religions, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. Uh, what about what are we going to be talking about today? So I wanted to talk about the wonderful joys of going out into fields and picking cherries. And I thought, oh, we also have an atheist podcast. So let's uh -huh. do that as well. We'll talk about cherry picking today. It's going to be a fun one. But before we go into the meat and potatoes of it, or the cherry, the stems and the pits, <laughs> if you will, we'll throw it up to our own Dread Pirate Higgs for our own weekly vacation. Vacation? Invocation. Invocation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, our newly Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the noodle to know the difference. That's right. Amen. Yeah. That's a new one. I like that one a lot. Yeah, that's cool. I like that one a lot. I really do. Uh, Dread, we're going to throw it up at you. How you been since last week, my friend? Not too bad. It's uh, been kind of slow. I've been playing lots of World of Warcraft, so kind of catching up on my tunes. Not bad. I, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. When you say lot, your tunes, lot... is that music? No, my uh, T O O N S, my uh, characters. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, very, very cool. I got a bunch of them and getting to know this new guild I'm in and doing some raiding and all that kind of stuff. So, so you already yeah. have a Twitch channel set up. Do you ever stream your playing as well? I, I don't have a Twitch channel, no. You should get a Twitch channel. I thought you live stream. <laughs> no. Okay, so you're live I, I, I just live stream on YouTube. Ah, okay. Listen, you can live stream on YouTube playing games as well. Like, hey, if you want more people, like there's a that's a pretty good audience right there. Some of the considered. <laughs> we can talk about that. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, Larry Rose. Oh, I, I oh, did just, before I go. Okay. Um we have this, I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but uh, here in, in BC, we have an adopt a highway um, program. And yeah. so uh, we figured out how to, uh, so there's a difference between um, gr groups and individuals. If you're a group, like an official group, you actually have to take out insurance as a group to do volunteer work for this adopt highway program. Wow. So, get in yeah, I know. Eh? <laughs> and it, yeah. And it's like 450 bucks a year. Yeah. You know, when you're not making any money, I mean, it's kind of hard to uh, justify spending that kind of coin on, on insurance to do volunteer right. work. Yet um, if you're an individual, you don't yeah, have to pay so, for insurance. Exactly. So what we've, what we've done instead of doing it was the church of the flying spaghetti monster and crew. Um, we just have uh, a symbol of uh, the flying spaghetti monster, you know, this fella and, um, and crew. So, uh, it's kind of like, uh, it could be Smith and friends. So it, it qualifies under that sort of, uh, um, a low level group, not an official group. So we got a two stretch, a two kilometer stretch of highway, uh, just East of grand forks that, uh, is going to have a sign post on it yeah. with that symbol. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask. Whole bit. Oh, really? So, oh, cool. Yeah. Very nice. So interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Here in Tennessee, uh, like Eastern Tennessee, Knoxville area, uh, the rationalists of East Tennessee do that as well. They've had their sign vandalized a couple times and destroyed once, I think, mm. but they keep at it. So who yeah. pays for insurance on the sign? Oh, it's a state sign. Yeah. So the state uh, just replaces it or cleans it. Cool. Larry Rhodes, Doubter 5, how you been? Oh, doing fine. I nice. took my motorcycle out again this week. It's been so beautiful. I've taken it out two or three times. It's just really awesome. 
it has been really, really nice. I hope this rain spit that we're getting right now goes away pretty soon. I'd like to be able to go and travel a little bit this week. Um, sure. I want to check out the local national areas, see new disc golf courses, just try some new food places. Um, and if not, I don't care if I got to play in the rain, I'm, I'm ha- I'm out here to have some fun. I took the week off, so I'm just having some time to get my, my whole self focus, clean up some of the mess that's behind me that you can see and enjoy some time with my cat. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. George Brown, two and a half. How you been? Well, um, not so good as of yesterday because I decided to, uh, take a try to take a vacation from coffee, and and you all know how how devoted to good coffee I am. Yeah. So yesterday, I didn't have any coffee, and man, was I a space cadet the whole day. Yeah, was yeah. just shot. Are you so, having headaches? Just withdrawal. Kidding. Withdrawal can give you headaches. I didn't have headaches. I just was a space case for the mm. entire day. I couldn't get anything done. So today, I'm back at it. You're back at it. <laughs> how fast did you wake back up? What's that? How fast did you wake back up? I can't remember. I, no, I didn't. Um, I, I was, I mean, I, I just got up, you know. I, okay. I, I slept very late. So, but the other thing I wanted to mention before we get going is um, we were talking last week about narcissistic personality uh-huh. disorder. And I just wanted to mention if, if anybody is interested in finding out more about this which I recommend very highly. Uh, I, I want to recommend again uh, a woman named Romani Dervasala. Well, you're going to have to spell that name. She, well, you, you just have to look up, uh, go on YouTube and look up Dr. Romani. That's R A M A N I. And th- you can do the same thing on whatever search engine you have. She's an, she's an especially good clear explainer of cluster B personality disorders and um, a lot about the way these people affect the rest of us. Uh, She's wonderful at it. So again, Dr. Romani, R-A-M-A-N-I. And if you're of a more of a religious persuasion, George Simon, uh, both of these people are psychologists. They're coming at it from different angles. I love it. That's enough. I fact. love it. What? I can't yeah. wait to read through those reports and cherry pick the information that already lines up with my <laughs> view on Did reality. Notions. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, I want to talk about uh, the idea of cherry picking. And before we go into it, maybe we should talk about what we mean by cherry picking before we go into like a full on discussion about it. And so when I say cherry picking, we'll do a quick round table. But when I say cherry picking, I mean, um, uh, letting your confirmation bias drive you towards the information you want to pay attention to and the ones that you don't want to pay attention to. And so like you have a little filter that says, I have a, I have a established conclusion on something and I'm only interested in the information that supports that conclusion and anything else I will happily ignore. Dread Pirate, what do you think cherry picking is? Yeah, pretty much the same thing. Um, you know, especially if you're doing internet searches, uh, yeah. you tend to end up going down rabbit holes if you're really, um, if you've really bought into uh, an idea or a conclusion that you've come to. Uh, you tend to confirm um, that with the searches that you do, and uh, leave out the disconfirming information. So, yeah. And yeah. why is Google my girlfriend so to... mean? <laughs> yeah, Google, I'll give you the only mean the Google result. bubble. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. Larry, sorry. Reinfor- the Google bubble can reinforce that as well. I mean, even without you thinking about it. Yeah. It yeah. will show you stuff that it knows that you're interested in and not show you stuff that you're not. Yeah. And the scary thing is it's not just Google. It's what news source you prefer to listen to. It's right. what mm-hmm. brands you prefer to buy from. It's, uh-huh. you know, it's what form of it, uh, news or like radio, TV, whatever, yeah. or any way you choose to inform yourself. Has Fox, a, CNN. Has a slant of bias to it. And you yeah. got to be aware of that. You got to be aware of that. Yeah. George Brown, the two and a half. What do you, th- what do you, how do you feel about cherry picking? Do you have a definition for it? About cherry picking? Yeah. Oh boy, um, I don't have an entry point on that, uh, except, you know, uh, I don't use Google as a search engine. There are alternatives. You don't have to use Google to do your searches. Oh, I just and, meant any any search engine that t- pays attention to what you search for and then offers oh, you yeah. the same. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, uh, um, Start Page does not, and 
DuckDuckGo does not. But um, in other words, you, you are free from surveillance on those search engines until you land on the page you're looking for, and that's a whole other story. But on the topic, how, how, how can you be sure? Are you just cherry picking that? <laughs> it's, because they say, it's just because of what they say about themselves. But George, I want to hear what you think about cherry picking. What do you think it is? What do I think it is? Well, yeah. it's, it's like what uh, people have said ahead of me. Um, you know, it's, it's squeezing the facts Ooh. through the filter of your own calendar, you know? Hey, I like that. I like it. I like it. I like that. And, and, Squeeze um, some facts out. And only filter uh, in the ones and, I care and, about. And I, I, you know, I, press. I, I have press. to confess that I think that we all do it. I think I do it. You of know? course, yeah. Um, and so while we know we all do it, I think that's fact. I think it's also be, I think it's two parts. One, we got to be aware that we do it. And two, we need to have an appreciation for a standard of evidence that's high enough to call us out when we do it ourselves and, and mm -hmm. be willing, and maybe a third point, be willing to admit when we're not wrong and acquiesce towards the reality or comport towards reality, right? But here's an interesting example I want to throw this out. Uh, in America, it's this really nice country. When I say America, I mean North America, uh, United States of America, <laughs> right? Uh, even more specifically, United States, right? Uh, there's a government facility called the Pentagon or an establishment called the Pentagon, um, and they hold documents sometimes for long periods of time to make sure that there's not public outcry on, some per on particular things. So when police write reports that people have seen something in the IR, Pentagon will be like, we're gonna take this report and we're gonna make it classified for a period of time, 20 years or so. And so what happened was a large batch of UFO sightings was finally released by the Pentagon. Uh, this was back in June, so it's actually not too recent, but um, we've had time to now be aware that the report was out because the Pentagon is going to make an announcement announcement about stuff like that. And it's sort of like filtered through the internet and people who are enthusiasts about UFOs and alien sightings and extraterrestrial life visiting earth have used that report as fuel to say, aha, the government was hiding something. Here's the proof of it that confirms that everything we've been saying about aliens is absolutely true. However, the reports themselves, Oh, go ahead, Larry. Go ahead. I wanted you to finish that thought. Sure. Okay. But the reports themselves, and which we all have access to, and we can even provide a link in the comment descriptions, even from the title itself basically says, yeah, it's mostly just people seeing lights in the air. There's no, there's no conclusive information among all these reports. It's still a very nebulous topic. We're not saying no, we're not saying yes. It's just, here's a bunch of people saying they saw some lights and they couldn't identify them. The end. Right. Larry. Well, people don't realize that there are more than one definition for a word, you know, like faith or something. And, mm -hmm. But certain people will read that report, and every single time they see the word UFO or the initials, they'll think aliens. Yeah. And it's not aliens. It's unidentified flying objects. It could be anything from a weather balloon to a weather uh, phenomenon or a reflected light. It could be. But it could be aliens, Larry. Uh-oh, everyone froze. <laughs> <laughs> aliens um per se they mean what it says unidentified flying objects sure dread i got the northern lights so i, I see oh. lights in the sky <laughs> all the time yeah, and they, they also audience, call he has christmas lights over his that's head. right the um yeah <laughs> i guess that's important to point out uh -huh. um <laughs> they also call them uh, UAPs, unknown aerial phenomenon. Mm -hmm. huh. they, they, they've got that alternate name. I as hadn't well. heard that. I've not. Well, heard because that it's either. it's not necessary because flying object is a misnomer in the sense that un, it's an yeah. unknown aerial phenomenon. Yeah. So sure. it could be like a other a things dirigible. other than than it flying really fly as <laughs> much as as float. <laughs> Dred, yeah. that's a very good point. I didn't know about that distinction. Well, I you think about Venus. Venus has been misidentified <clears throat> throughout, you know, all known time, essentially, as, as At least something. Since 1945. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Cool. George, you wanted to make a comment? Yeah, uh, we have a, a senator here in the United States, uh, Joe Manchin. I think he's an unidentified flying object. <laughs> okay. Oh, and, that's and a good picture. Although, 
<laughs> Although uh, there you go. In, in Yiddish, there's a wonderful there's a wonderful term in Yiddish. It's luftmensch, which means airman. Airman. Know? Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Thanks for sharing that. I yeah, have airman. seen. Well, I have. So I've gone jogging before, and I have looked up into the air, and I have seen like a ring of lights in a blue sky. Like I've seen things that I would qualify as like an unidentified aerial phenomenon. And I would look at that thing and like my skeptical brain is like, Tyrone, that's not a UFO, but I still don't know what it is. And it's probably just so bright outside that I can't see an outline of something, but it is like a, a static ring of lights in the air. And I'm like, what the hell could that be? And my brain just goes like, I really would like UFO. to know what it is, yeah. but until then I'm happy for it not being I won't jump to the conclusion of aliens, but I'm just like, it's so interesting that I could easily do that. And yet we're all seeing the same thing and, and I can see the mania sort of leap towards it. But in terms of cherry picking, in terms of cherry picking, I could definitely say that if I wanted to believe in aliens, I could use that as an excuse and then go on Google and be like, I found ring of lights, aliens. And then Google's like, oh, he's, he put these words together. Just show them alien stuff and ring of lights and then throw in some dog food commercials because we need to sell some dog food. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing too. And that's how, in my head, people fall into like deeper and deeper circles because they'll start connecting with other people who also believe that rings of lights in the air are aliens and maybe they all have a shared love of dog food. Next thing you know, they're at a convention and more money keeps going around. Dread, what do you think? You know, sometimes that cherry picking too is combined with, um, you know, the uh, uh, incredulity. You know, argument incredulity, from incredulity. Yes. Yes, um, yes, how yes. how could it be an area? You know, how could it be Venus? I mean, right. it, it was moving too fast. It's too bright. You know, it's blah blah blah. You know, there's no way I could be wrong. Or how yeah. you have to prove that I'm wrong before I'm even willing to consider any other options. It's just like, there's, that's the worst place to be in. The default option is not you are right. The default mm -hmm. option is you should keep working harder to figure out why you are right. Not mm -hmm. I'm right until I'm proven wrong. It's like, why are yeah. you right? George thoughts? Well, <laughs> following up on what Dread Pirate just said, um, I go out walking sometimes at night and and i was like i was looking up in the sky and i saw this small constellation and i thought hmm, what's that well it, it when i look with my right eye it's one star <laughs> <laughs> I, i've got i've got internal reflections in my left eye you know i'm an old guy i mean stuff happens when you're old and ah uh, but i can I, you know, with my left eye, it's, it's a constellation, and it's really cool, you know? Too bad it's not real. So so in the event of me not worrying about this any longer, I actually did look it up on Google to figure out what the Ring of Lights was, but I didn't put Alien or anything behind it. And it turns out there's a novel community of people who send up weather balloons up into the air, and the weather balloons are ribbed, and they have sort of like a, a iridescent surface on the outside such that each rib has a little reflection of light if there's a sun oh, yeah. on a clear day. And I said, I saw this ring of light on a clear day. I had no idea what it was. It's a weather balloon that went up into the air and each of those little ribs have a tiny little sparkle sunspot on them. And I can't see the outline of the balloon because it's too far away, but I can see the bright circle of lights. Right, like, right. There it is. That's what I saw. But I had, cool. to look, I had to look it up on Biasly to figure that out. And whether or not I'm right, maybe it was an alien in a really spacey suit or something like that. But at least By I have Occam's a... razor. So uh, let's see if my following Occam's razor. Yeah. The least number of assumptions makes more valid uh, argument. Most of the time, let's see. I would say, yeah, that's fair. I was fair. Like I'm not assuming aliens have to exist. We already know weather balloons do exist. I find like that's the most simplest and least assumptive approach. So yeah. Yeah. I would also say, uh, what is it? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? And so mundane claims only require mundane evidence. And we mm. already know weather balloons exist. Sunlight exists. We can put yeah. these two together and I can make a better argument for it being just a weather balloon on a sunny day than I could be for an alien force visiting us from another galaxy, right? Yeah. I love stuff like that. I love stuff like that. Uh, let's see. Larry, you want to talk about that picture in the background that you got? Oh, my mute, my buddy, mute, my buddy. There you go. 
Okay, there it is. Nice. Um, yeah, it's a picture from 1943, I think, during World War II, uh, when a, a UFO was reported off the uh, West Coast, uh, California, specifically near um, Los Angeles. And it it showed up. <clears throat> we've spotted it. We've shown lights on it, um, but spotlights like we would if it was an air raid. We shelled it with artillery and followed it for wow. uh, half, two hours <laughs> down the coast, <laughs> never hurting it at all. Mm. And uh, finally, it just flew away. I mean, if you've got a minute to, and you're interested in this kind of stuff, do a search for uh, the Battle of Los Angeles. And I think it was 1943. But it, it makes for good reading anyway. So there is something to be said about pressure to come to a conclusion, right? Like if you're in the middle uh -huh. of a wartime and mm -hmm. you may need to use right. cherry picking as a survival mechanism, I'm not saying cherry picking. So here's, a, here's, my, here's my hot take. Cherry picking isn't always bad. And there seems to exist almost out of oh, evolutionary. Yeah. Out of like yeah. a natural need to quickly come to a conclusion that can help to save you if there's a threat and help you understand right. the environment that you're in. But it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily mean it's the most accurate way to come to a conclusion. No. So, and uh, go ahead, Dred. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was going to say uh, that, that reminds me of uh, Daniel Kahneman's uh, uh, research on thinking fast and slow. He wrote a book about yeah. that. And there's the, the the style A and style B of thinking. The style A being uh, arriving at uh, quick uh, conclusions about your environment in order to, you know, save yourself from, uh, right. I mean, if you hear a rustle in the, in the, in the trees or in the grasses, assume it's a tiger, because if you assume it's the wind, well, guess what? You're less likely that's toast, less likely, yeah, less likely <laughs> to survive that one if it is a tiger. So absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, George. Um, yeah. What do, do any of us ever search on Google and click that button that says i'm feeling lucky yes sometimes i do occasionally. it occasionally yeah sometimes happens, i do it. i've never gotten lucky <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you do that that, that I, you know if i use it it sends it you to the very top point? search it sends you to the very huh? top search it sends you automatically to the very very top search it is a funny button but i haven't clicked it in years but i have clicked that button a couple of times but i would also say on on dread pirates note um so you have this idea where you have slow thinking, which is what we're getting good at now as a society. Right. Like we are being yeah. rational, we're being empathetic, we're being um, progressive with our you know, approach to a lot of problems and being more sensitive to a lot of things. And it takes a lot of consideration. It's way more complicated, but we tend to come out to uh, conclusions that help uh, a great proportion of society, right? But then we mm -hmm. also have this, fast thinking, which is really, really good in terms of like, okay, we just got to stay alive. Who cares who, what needs to be damaged or what needs to be killed? It's whatever's the most useful thing, just move forward. Maybe yeah, not yeah. the best way to control society, but uh, maybe a good on an individualistic basis to at least, you know, maintain life for a period of time. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to make one, one last thing. The evolution of it seems to be that we've had that quick thinking uh, pathway a lot longer than the long uh, the slower pathway thinking and Absolutely. because of that it's still very persuasive to us to do things in the quick thinking fashion including cherry picking mm -hmm. well it in, in it informs the flight or fight uh, response yep. too right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's if you've got you know your if your environment dictates that you have to think quick Mm. You're going to be looking out for yourself and making decisions based on not reflection right? and, and long considered thought of the facts and evidence and all the rest. You're just going to go with what you think is <laughs> absolutely going to save your skin. And so this is why I like escape rooms. I don't know if you ever played an escape room game before. I've heard like, of them. I've heard of them. Okay. Okay. They may have, they have some in Tennessee as well, but essentially you, you and a group of friends and maybe some strangers who will join your group or a different group of friends will team up and be blindfolded and be brought to a room where there are puzzles. But the theme of the room is like, Hey, you're going to die in a half hour. If you don't figure out the main puzzle to solve in this room and they take the blindfolds off and you're like in some weird dungeon <laughs> or like a medical area or like some museum. It's like, like, like saw. House. It's a lot like saw, but sometimes it's classy. Sometimes it's like casino Royale and you're like, Oh wow. Okay. Everyone's like, you know, there's like roulette tables here, but they all have like weird pictograms on them and you have to figure out 
where's the pattern? What are we trying to figure out here? And you are pressured to figure out something as soon as possible. And there are obvious threats all around you in the sense of there's timers on the wall. There's an announcer saying you got five minutes left. I, I, I cut <laughs> fingers off and I'm going to come after you. If you don't solve this in time, your, your blood is, you know, highly pressurized. You're, you're freaking out, but you have to think slowly and calmly to deduce all of these problems. And you have to communicate so with the people. <laughs> we didn't pass either. Don't worry, but you have to communicate with the people in your team to, so that everyone can split up properly and start solving their areas in the room. And you have to like work together and be like, I saw this. Does anyone have a key? Cause I need a key. Cause I just opened it up and there's a key here. It's like, I have a key. I have a red key and a green key. It's like, I have a key too. I have a blue key. It's like, I need the green key. It's like, okay, everybody come together. We'll figure out where everything goes. It's so fun. Cause your brain is like fight, flight, run or fight. And the other side is like, we have to figure out how many cities there are in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> And it just keeps, hey, what's up, Dred? What's up? Well, I was going to say, um, it's, that's kind of like firefighting too. Ah. Uh, the number one cause, the number one cause of panic is not having a plan. Mm. And that's why, you know, firefighters constantly are, are rehearsing really? and practicing their techniques and whatnot. So that when it comes to uh, a situation where you're in, you know, faced a burning building and you're going to have to do a, uh, you know, an interior search, um, you remain calm because you have a plan and you've practiced it. And it, and a lot of it then becomes sort of muscle memory and uh, all that sort of thing. So that keeps your, keeps your panic button um, in your back pocket, so to speak. I love um, it. Yeah. The number one cause of panic is not having a plan. And I feel like that is the number one way to probably stop cherry picking. If you just plan out your means of understanding information or your epistemology, ahead of time mm. and then you'll have yeah. a much better way it's certainly like establishing like you said establishing a, a standard of evidence yes if you don't have a standard and you're just willy-nilly well then you'll take anything that comes but yeah if you firmly it. establish in your own mind that you uh, subject evidence to a certain amount of rigor mm -hmm. um then you can at least have a reliable method for determining what's true and what's not true i love it i love it larry i think we're at the bottom of the half about time, isn't it? Nice. Uh, this is the Digital <laughs> Free Thought Radio Hour at WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we'll be right back after this short break. 103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Hello, and welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Doubter Five, and we're on WOZO Radio, 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is Sunday morning, October 3rd, and let's talk for a second about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in nine, sorry, 2002, and we're in our 19th year. ASK has over a thousand members and we have weekly Zoom meetings during COVID, but we're again meeting in person downtown Tuesday evenings at Barley's Tap Room Pizzeria in Knoxville's old city out on the patio. So if it's Tuesday evening, you're off work, come on down and meet some other atheists. Uh, you can also find us online on Facebook, meetup.com or knoxvilleatheist.org. Just look for Atheist Society of Knoxville. Just that simple. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and do a search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start one. one. That's right. Uh, where do we want to pick up one bet? Hey, we're finishing up our talk on cherry picking today, and I wanted to bring up a new um, side topic. Boudreau sent us a, a article, well, actually sent us a, um, a citation to a scientific art, or scientific uh, literature magazine journal is what they're called. Um, and what they do is they, this journal is in toxico toxicology and they issued a report by a guy who was anti-vax, basically anti-vaccination of children. And he said, hey, you know, uh, most people who get vaccines are old, or I'm sorry, most people who get uh, sick from COVID are old. Therefore, we shouldn't vaccinate children because why would we even bother vaccinating children? And the report uh -huh. didn't really talk anything about how kids can be vectors for diseases. They instead, right, right. or how you know, a room full of kids could easily infect uh, an adult teacher. But instead, it was more of just like, here are the numbers that agree with my conclusion, 
And I've select, I specifically selected the ones that match this narrative that I have. And what is the case to be discussed here is that in journals or in scientific journals, there are room for things called editorials, which are essentially opinion pieces. And those are subject to whether or not the editor of that journal would like to publish them or not. And they tend to be more provocative to inspire conversation or sell more <laughs> journals at the end of the day. Whereas you also have areas for scholarly articles, reviews and reports, which are peer reviewed by other scientists before they even get to the editor. And then that paper is a thoroughly investigated and, and thoroughly vested scientific article. And the scientifically article, the scientifically weighed articles are not the same thing as the opinion pieces, yet they are published in the same journals. And the problem with that is that People will look through a journal to find a, 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 a well-established journal to find the opinion piece that matches their kooky conclusion and then point at science to say, and it's backed by science when it's not. It's just an opinion piece that's in a scientific journal. And that's cherry picking. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of dangerous. George, you have thoughts on that? Take yourself off mute. Um, well, I actually, I, I wanted to go back to something that... Um... Dread Pirate said at the end of the last half hour about firefighters. I, I like that. Um, he said, uh, you have to have a plan. And, you know, if you're going to come out alive from fighting the fire. And, and I thought, well, where, where do firefighters get that plan? And I realized they rehearse, they practice on yeah. stuff, you mm -hmm. know. And... Um, uh, one of the things that I notice when I go around from place to place is those little practice structures that firefighters use right. yeah, to the learn villages their craft. That they, they have that they can set fires and then practice putting them out. Yeah. yeah. What, what are those structures called, Dread Pirate? Do you know? Well, they're just uh, fire grounds. You don't practice fire grounds. Yeah. Um, we've got one. We set one up here in uh, Grand Forks uh, with a bunch of sea cans. And, uh, you know, so we got sea cans stacked on each other. We have- What's a sea can? Um, What's a sea can? I think we're, a little off, you know, I think we're getting a little storage. off topic. I want to just make sure that we're focused right now yeah, on sure. okay. picking it and we can have this conversation later. <laughs> I'm, so the main thing I want to- Let me get back to what I was gonna saying. Just, just going to reintroduce the topic, which was, hey, in science, there are people who publish articles that some of them can be opinion pieces and some of them are not opinion pieces, but people will cherry pick from scholarly articles and then use that as a claim that science supports their uh, misinterpreted conclusion. And that can be very, very dangerous on a number of fronts. George, would you like to talk about the topic? Well, okay, well, <laughs> again, I wanna finish what I was saying before, which is that perhaps we need, like the firefighters, work with, practice, with these practice structures that we need to practice free thought free Absolutely. thinking Absolutely. to try to catch ourselves mm -hmm. in cherry picking in our own minds. One of the things that I've seen online that and mm -hmm. I'm sure you all have seen it too, is the outsider test of faith uh, yes. that I think is a good example of that to step out of your little cocoon of information. Uh, consider your religion from the outside, like from another religious view or from an atheist view and uh, and try to pick it apart, try to find what's real, what's not real, what's evidential, what you can support from outside the religion before you just throw all of your faith toward that, uh, those answers and just accept them. Yeah. <clears throat> so what's that called again? The, o the OTF. The yeah. Outsider test of faith. Mm -hmm. Dred, did you want to make a comment? No. Okay, Dred, I'm gonna ask you a question. Sure. We both do uh, Socratic examination on, on, and something I've maybe heard that you have maybe heard as well is someone saying science or science agrees with this conclusion that I have. That's clearly not scientific, right? It's like, well, science right. says there's no evolution. And when I ask, what do you mean by that? What they typically say is, well, there's a lot of scientists who agree that evolution doesn't actually exist. And in my head, that's the, the idea of like, ah, scientists, 
are not the same thing as science as the right. Process. It's an argument from authority. Right. It's an argument from authority. Being authority where you cherry picked it to be. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But they still want all the gravitas of saying science, but they don't want any of the actual conclusions yeah. from yeah. the yeah. process. Yeah. Hey, what's up? You got to separate, got to separate the method from the people who practice it. Right. From yeah. the opinions and the people. Exactly. Correct. What, Correct. I, what I like to say is that when, re when religious scientists uh, yes. are doing science, they're not doing religion. And vice versa. When they're doing a religion, they're not doing science. Unless you work for Ken Ham. So, Even then, I would say it still doesn't get That's not science if they're doing it, you know. <laughs> that's the arts and crafts project that just went out of control. <laughs> Ken Ham, I'm lost. It's okay. It's okay. He's I don't the, want you. To, the I don't want you. I don't want any, we, we don't got to talk about that guy. <laughs> the less we know about him, the better. That's that's my point. Google your own rabbit holes on that, dude. But I would also say this. I agree with what you said, Larry. I think we do have these things called religious sciences. And mm -hmm. often, so way back when, the only way you could get funding to do science was by grouping up with the church who would fund your scientific endeavors as long as it supported if, what the church right. wanted. Right, Larry? <laughs> not only, if it didn't, not only would they remove your funding if you had it in the first place, but they would destroy your works and sometimes destroy you. Yeah, yeah. and kill you at the same time, too, or imprison right. you for the rest right. of your Galileo life. Galileo is a perfect example of that. Oh, yeah. there's no, so no, many. Bruno. Yeah. Punnett. Bruno uh, was actually Darwin. the stake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there were so many great scientists back in the day who were advent or essentially adjuncts of a church. It's the pioneers in science who went against what the church was reporting that gave us some of the greatest breakthroughs. And even those moments were such a struggle on their part yeah. because they're like, maybe earth isn't the center of the universe. We're going to put you in jail for the rest of your life. Like, yeah, but I still feel like that's the way it is. Put me in jail. I'm yeah. only going to live till I'm 40 anyways. Like <laughs> super uh, way back uh, when. I don't care. I don't care. I'm like 37. It's all good. Don't worry about it. But uh, I do feel <laughs> like that is, I would think we should, um, how do I put it? Honor the perseverance of people who help to pursue scientific interests and truth. And whether or not those people have uh, people at large have opinions doesn't necessarily influence the process of science, which is combating ideas and opinions and seeing which floats to the top. And I feel like that's always the best pursuit. So when people point out like one article that agrees with them, I always like to see what are the other articles saying about that article or like what, what are the citations in that article and how do people uh, take those in the grand scheme of things? I would say science is not looking at one journal article and being like, ha, huh, this agrees with my point. Therefore it's true. It's a process where we have, um, um, records and we investigate those records and we always ask questions and we never accept anything as absolutely true, but we're always willing to say, Hey, does this meet the standard of evidence for the claim or not? And I think mm -hmm. that's something we should always have. George, what's up? Well, I was just thinking, um, we live in a democracy and you do two dread pirate in Canada. And, um, I think that the success of a democracy to me depends on the ability of the participants in that democracy to think clearly. And so we think that we are the people who do the clear thinking. And I agree with myself. So there, uh -huh. but um, how do we get, how do we convince the rest of the guys to come along with us? That's You've asked this question a number of times, but what's your answer that you have as the best answer, George? I don't have an answer. I'm asking you guys. I think the question is good enough as an answer. I think in my head, if you're asking people, how can you get to us? How can you come to a correct conclusion better? That is the question that you need to be asking, even if you're making statements or if you're questioning statements, mm -hmm. because that's how you get better right. at knowing true things from false things is by questioning how do I get and a better then, way? You have, to, you have to be able to care in the first place, I guess. Yeah. And, and that's often a, a, a question that's asked of, a, of an interlocutor in Socratic examination. Interlocutor being your interview partner, partner. Yep. Um, is how do you arrive at how do you arrive at, at your truth? You know, what is the method by which you uh, examine the things that you um, use to support your beliefs? And you know, the weirdest thing I have is for me, I find, and this is going to be the part where everyone's going to 
cherry pick this clip for me and be like, aha, Tyrone doesn't care about the truth. But I find the truth to be uh, overrated if it's nominal to what can be useful and understood within a particular model. So like in my head, if I can demonstrate something very well and I'm off by like 0.00001% and the truth is that one 0.0001% away, I'm fine with not knowing the absolute truth. I'm totally happy with this model if it works. And a good mm -hmm. example of that, uh, Google Maps used to be like two years ago based on the flat earth model because you don't have to you know, uh, estimate the curvature of the earth if you're just driving from here to McDonald's, right? It's just a straight road and it's 2.4 miles away. Maybe it's 2.47015 miles away because if you include the curvature, it's a little longer. It's like, I don't care, dude. Just tell me 2.4 miles and how <laughs> long it'll take for me to drive there. About four minutes, fantastic. This model works and it's useful. It may not be the absolute truth. It may not be the absolute time that I arrive on time. Maybe there's traffic or whatever, but it works for me. And it's at least useful in this mundane capacity. And what's the issue is, is when people have that low standard of for mundane things and they apply it to incredibly extraordinary things like the existence of a God or, um, <clears throat> or even take in my head two different standards and say, well, my extraordinary God has told me that it's not necessary for me to get vaccinated. And I'm like, oh, you've compounded a very low standard of evidence to a highly incredible statement and are believing whatever this big statement tells you about mundane things. Like you're caught in this really vicious loop that may actually lead to uh, needless harm. And mm -hmm. so I wish yeah. for is this, this cherry picking that we do to at least be acknowledged of the fact that like, Hey, for mundane things like Google maps, that's okay. Cause I'm not really hurting anybody. If I arrive at McDonald's 30 seconds later than I'm supposed to, but when it comes to interacting with other human beings, I want to have the highest standard of information possible. And so maybe I'll cherry pick less on that and, and be more comfortable with getting closer to the more absolute truth. If I can be Larry. Yeah. Well, what gets me is that the, the opposition would say, uh, yeah, it was 99%, 99.3%. And then they took consideration. Well, they don't want to tell you all this stuff, but now it's 99.9% .9 after they take in whatever else. See, right. Science was wrong. Mm. <laughs> you know, yes. they, just, they, just, no. they lied to you. So, you know, they, they, it's either right or wrong. It's one right. or the other. It can't be both. Dread. I was just going to point out too, I was listening actually to um, an episode of the skeptic guide to the universe podcast. And um, they're, they're, they're a real great group for anyone who is looking for content. But um, you know, the, the point was made is that the, the theories of science are, are models of reality. Yes. They're not, they're not depic true depictions of what, we think reality is they're models and that's why they can change over time um, right. as new evidence comes in and new information right. comes in yeah, it's the darwin's nothing, theory is a good example because exactly. he didn't have any knowledge of uh, dna or germs. he gave us a good model yep. uh, right. that we could use going forward exactly yep hey i'm going to throw this out too it's going to touch on both of your points but the idea of science being wrong um i've heard i've had conversations on my youtube channel where people say aha they said this drug would work but then they realized it didn't work Science was wrong. Science was wrong. And I was like, in my head, that's not an example of science being wrong. That's an example of science getting something right. Because when science figures out something doesn't work, it's the first thing in the line to be like, hey, self this doesn't work, right? It's self-correcting. It has a self-correcting feature. Yeah. When something yeah. doesn't work in religion or faith, there's nothing. You're the problem. <laughs> right. right. Uh -huh. And it's not a and, 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 you, and you think about how slow the Pope has come to, you know, accepting responsibility on behalf of the church for some, I mean, think about Galileo, uh, you know, apologizing for that? Galileo. Have they apologized that like for that 10 yet? years ago or something? Oh my gosh, that's terrible. Yeah. Larry, what's up? What's yeah, up? Back when uh, Edison was working on the light bulb, uh, he'd worked on it for years and couldn't find the uh, correct uh, what do you call it, element that wouldn't burn up and the interviewer was saying uh, you know so you, you haven't had anything but failure for the last year he says ah but I know a thousand things that don't work <laughs> so he could move on from that yeah. it was it was progress even Absolutely. though he hadn't reached the right element hey what's up uh, Dred? yeah I just uh, one of our viewers here uh, his name is Redonk and he goes, absolute truth doesn't exist. Truth is a measure of confidence. 
truth is a measure of confidence. Huh? We'd have to touch on that. I have to think about that a little bit more. Um, so well, that would explain why religion says they always have capital T truth. They have ultimate confidence in their religion. Right. Their yeah, absolute confidence. But Edison in his own right is an interesting figure. Cause I feel like, you know, it takes someone to try to make something to realize that when you hit a wall, it's not the end of the project, but rather a better resolution of how to make the project work. Like mm -hmm. you've hit a wall here. Now you know what to go around or what the next obstacle is in, in the process of making something. And one, one of the cool things he had a problem with was he was trying to figure out how do I make filaments burn longer for my incandescent lamps, right? And there was another patent guy, a black dude named Lewis Howard Latimer, who made a longer lasting filament for stuff like that. And had this since like, Hey, I'll take whatever I can get. This guy, let me take your stuff. It's like, I got my patent. It's like, okay, fine. We'll buy your patent. And Tom said, it's I'm rich as hell. I'm going to get your patent. And that was one of the tricks that, you know, collaboration and working with other scientists, figuring out, Hey, what small area are you an expert in? Can we collaborate? And can we build a model so I can get over the, the walls of things that I don't know? And in my head, it's just that collaborative aspect of science that makes the best ideas float to the top. And it tends to be the case that, great ideas don't happen in a vacuum and like great inventions don't happen by just one person. It takes a mm -hmm. team of people working together, questioning each other and trying to beat each other with the best information that lets the best things rise to the top. And I love that mm -hmm. dread first. And then Larry. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, Redonk clarifies his, his earlier statements. That, <laughs> yes. Science relies on being falsifiable and subject to scrutiny. Yeah. That I agree. Yeah. Larry? Absolutely. Well, I was just trying to say about the teams of scientists working together to find truth. Sometimes the teams of scientists aren't working together. That's how we found the, uh, the cosmic background radiation. One team was working to find it and they couldn't find it. And another team wasn't working to find it, but they found it and they oh, didn't know fantastic. what it was. And they, have, <laughs> they, they were fairly close together physically. And uh, they contacted each other and one group did the other. And it fit the bill. We now know a whole lot more about the cosmic background. And that, that's a beautiful story because it does show that science is a objective tool that different parties can use to figure out the same thing, even if the intentions were completely different. They point to mm -hmm. the same model of reality. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's such an accurate model that two different teams working in two different directions can arrive at the same conclusion, right? And you don't get that with religion because we have the Third Street Baptist Church who disagrees with the Second Street Baptist Church who says they got it all wrong. <laughs> Well, or he even one of the parish, he's all wrong. parishioners yeah. uh, doesn't think that the preacher's right, so he splits off and starts his own yeah. uh, denomination. George, what's up? I, I was just thinking of the example of, of where I live. Um, the the two counties, there, there are two counties here. One is large, one is tiny, and the, there's a newspaper that serves both count, count, counties, and they have uh, they list all the churches every Friday and and every once in a while I go and I read them and I count the churches. Wow. And so we have in these two counties, you know, t talking about the Baptist uh, spinoffs, Larry, we have 167 official Baptist churches. And then we have another 37 unofficial Baptist churches. And then we have the other ones that have split off completely from those. It's an sure. incredible number of churches. It's, it's an incredible it's personal number of revelation. It is. Yeah. And here's the yeah. thing too. And I want to make sure this is a point before we end the show, every single one of those people will call themselves Christian as if it was one thing uniformly mm -hmm. across all those mm -hmm. uh, subsections within that denomination. And Catholics will call themselves Christians. Protestants call themselves Christians. And the thing is, I'm not letting that pass for me anymore as an answer. When someone tells me a Christian, I ask them which kind or what kind, epistological, methodological, Lutheran, Protestant, Catholic, evangelical, I, I, Adventist. Like there's so many different kinds. I want to know what brand within this greater band that you think you are, because it's not one thing. And I find like by asking that question, it just helps them to realize one, I'm not taking whatever you tell me as like as a grain of salt. And two, I'm aware that there's more versions than you're letting on. And three, where are you in this grand scheme of things? And oftentimes I get, well, I'm non-denominational. It's like, oh, 
Welcome to. <laughs> I still don't know anything church about Church of One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah church, church of One. I still don't one. know anything about what you believe or what you don't believe, but thank you for at least <laughs> picking the the one of the best denominations out there, the non denominationals. <laughs> anyway, hey, I think we're getting close to the bottom of the half. George, are or the bottom of the second half? George, Top are you the feeling whole? Good? Top of the hour. Top, Top of the, the hour. Are you feeling good yeah. without your coffee buzz? Is it coming back to you? you you're looking. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm feeling good. I, I still want to know how how in the world am I going to give up coffee because I like it so much. Nice. Um, I, I'm hooked. I'm, I'm addicted, guys. Yeah. Help me. It's a thing. It's one of the weird um, in our culture. It's one of the weird acceptable psychotropics that people accept and sell to <laughs> yeah. kids and everyone thinks is normal, but eh, there you go. Uh, Dread Pirate, where can we find you at? Well, I'm live streaming uh, as we speak on my uh, YouTube channel, Mind Pirate, which can be, it's M-I-N-D-P-Y-R-A-T-E. And uh, I stream it at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So check it out. And I just got one more comment here from Redonk. He says, I think a more accurate wording would be that absolute knowledge doesn't exist. It's like infinity, something you can approach but never reach. I thought that was pretty yeah, good. As opposed to stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. That's yeah, great. come check out my channel and, and please subscribe. I'm I'm six viewers away or six uh, subscribers away from... Hey, I'll um, tell you how you do it. You, you start, streaming, my thing. start streaming some video games and people will be like, oh, he plays Fortnite <laughs> too? Next thing you know, um, all the 14-year-olds jump in your channel. Yeah, zillion I, I, I could like name it Ultimate Fails. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stand in fire. Fire. That's great. That's great. She said, what? <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm going to chat on YouTube. What have you got to do to make the algorithm work for you? And uh, we'll be here next week. Larry, why don't you take us out? Hey, remember, this show is on Apple iTunes, Pocket Cast, Amazon, and podcasts everywhere. Just search for Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I love that. Um, great edit. My, my content is on digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button for a radio show, archives, atheist songs, and many articles on the subject. I have a book. Uh, it's called Atheism, What's It All About? And it's available on Amazon. You can find my YouTube channel simply by searching for Larry Rhodes or Doubter 5. If you have any questions for the show, you can send them to askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like and subscribe. This has been the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Remember that everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. We'll see you next week. Say bye, everybody. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs>